Hey, thanks for joining today. This is part four in the technician class live stream breakdown that I recorded in 2020. I'm taking those three long live streams and broke them down into smaller, shorter parts for ease of use. Check the description below for the book where you can get the information to follow along with this series and also for the playlist of everything in order. This is part four, so you should have watched three of them already, or you can just kind of watch these in however you want to in whatever order you want to, to study certain sections of the book. This one right here is weak signal propagation and talking to outer space. You can talk to the International Space Station, you can talk on amateur radio satellites, and you can talk in weak signal propagation modes and learn about propagation, and that's all about this. So 73, thanks for watching. Check the links in the description below, and good luck on your test. Okay, so uh, there are many, many... Um areas of of amateur radio that you can uh, get involved with um one of them that we're going to talk about now is propagation um this is basically the study of how radio waves travel from one point to another um how they get from your transmitter to the destination uh there's mainly mainly three there's actually one more that uh, we may cover in a little bit uh the first one is line of sight that's basically you see it, the radio wave goes directly to you. FM is is generally line of sight, um, and that's why whenever it comes to antennas uh, on VHF and you're using FM, you the higher the better. Then there's also ground wave propagation. Uh, this is where the, uh, the radio wave follows the curve of the earth just a little bit, and then there's sky wave propagation, and we're going to go over each one of those. So line of sight propagation is when a radio signal travels directly from one antenna to another. Um, like I says, line of sight. Um, your cutoff point is going to be the horizon, maybe just a little bit past the horizon, but it, that is that is where uh, where that cutoff is going to be. It's going to be that horizon. Um, like I said, this is line of sight, point to point, directly. The higher the transmitting or receiving antenna is, the uh, the greater the line of sight propagation distance becomes. Uh, that's why you will oftentimes, uh, if you're driving, say, through uh, downtown Dallas and you look at the, say, the green building, one of the taller buildings um, in Dallas, the entire top of it is just lined with antennas because essentially the higher the antenna, the further your range will be. Uh, they are effectively blocked by the curvature of the earth at the radio horizon. Your radio horizon is just a little bit further than your eye, than your your visual horizon. Um, so that's going to be the uh, the cutoff there. Radio wave travel along the ground, bending slightly to follow the curvature of the Earth uh, for some distance, is called ground wave. So ground wave actually travel a little farther than the radio horizon. Um, if you could, uh, you could picture the horizon from a radio um, signal, it's actually a little, it makes the earth look a little less curved. It goes a little bit further uh, than, than uh, line of sight will. Actually, it can go quite a bit further depending on whatever's going on. Uh, so that's how ground waves travel. They, they actually travel along the ground um, and go past the line of sight, the radio horizon there. They go further than that. And then propagation, um, the last one is sky wave. And this is a very common practice in uh, HF operations, not so much VHF and UHF because of the, uh, the radio waves generally will go right through the ionosphere. But on HF, um, bouncing signals off of the ionosphere is very common practice. And it is one of the, uh, the most effective ways to actually um, – make it long distance contact is by ionosphere skyway propagation. So looking at the earth, looking at the ionosphere, um, during the day, this, the energy from the sun bombards the gases in the ionosphere causing ions to form. Uh, they separate into four layers and you can see here the D E F one and F two layers. Uh, they are radio waves are refracted back towards the earth. So when a signal, a radio frequency or an RF signal will go up, bounce off uh, of the uh, the ionosphere, and then back towards Earth. 
uh, we're able to bounce that radio signal off the ionosphere and back to Earth. We call that sky wave. The skip zone um, is is kind of a side effect of sky wave. So the skip zone is the area that is too far for ground wave, but too close for sky wave. It, it's kind of like a, uh, a dead zone in there. You might be able to hear, say the person, um, you might be able to hear the person down here um, at the, 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 the remote station, but you might not be able to hear the person who's actually, uh, transmitting at the other end because that signal is literally bouncing off and going right over you and, and overshooting you. Um, when it hits the ionosphere, the polarization of the signal, the original signal is randomized. Um, so it is very important that if you're going to try and make an HF contact, you need to start by listening uh, because there may be a couple of people there who are actually having a conversation, but you you may not be able to hear one, and so you'll want to listen and then ask if the if the uh, the frequency is in use. And oftentimes, you might be surprised. You might hear somebody come back and say it is, or yeah, it's in use, or you know, just something letting you know that you're in the skip zone, and you can determine that you're in the skip zone, and you can't hear one of the other stations. You're only hearing one. Not all radio waves are refracted by an ionosphere. Um, the frequency does make a difference. So the very low frequency, VLF, which is not a, a, uh, a range that we're going to discuss here, they actually get just, they just get absorbed uh, up, in the, up in the ionosphere. Uh, UHF and VHF signals usually will pass through. They, there might be some that, uh, that bounce bounce back down but generally they go right through they're just their wavelengths are too small uh, medium frequency and hf signals oftentimes will reflect so they'll go up and they will bounce right back down um, there is no exact frequency that frequency that that maximum usable frequency changes hour to hour day by day minute by minute even second by second, because uh, you may be talking to somebody and all of a sudden they just fade away and, and you're done. That's uh, you're, you're done with that QSO. So the, uh, that does that, that propagation does change and it can change very quickly. So the D layer located about 30 to 60 miles above earth's surface, uh, the ionization only lasts while exposed to the sun's rays. It's good for 10 meter propagation during the daytime. A little bit higher, the E layer is located 60 to 70 miles above Earth. Um, just like the D region, it lasts only during the sun uh, while the sun is up and ionizing and charging that, uh, that layer. The E layer communication is only possible during the day. And there's a reason why. Um, the F layer ranges from about 100 to 310 miles above the Earth. F region splits into two parts, F1 and F2. Uh, using the F2 region uh, with two-way radio contacts, can, you can easily make a, a contact 2,500 miles away uh, without any problem. The F2 region, F2 region is responsible for almost all long-distance communications on frequencies from uh, 1.8 to 3 on, on our HF frequencies. Now I did say that the D and the E are only available, are only only possible to use during the day, and the reason is at night when the sun is not charging the um, the ionosphere, all of those all of those layers collapse into just the F layer. So during the day it's broken up D E F one F two. As soon as the sun goes down, those collapse all into one. Um, and that's one of the reasons that when the sun goes down, right after the sun goes down, you can get amazing long time, long range communications at night on the shortwave bands. So at night, everything can blast down into a single F layer. And it's usually the highest layer up there. Um, and so you can get, I mean, just amazing, amazing DX contacts. 
Now, tropos, tropospheric, tropospheric ducting is a – it's kind of a phenomenon. It's really um, – it's a really interesting thing happens, and I'll give you an example of it here in just a sec. Uh, it's a temperature inversion that causes a layer of warm air to be sandwiched in between a layer of cooler air. Um, I said that exactly. The cool air on the outside and warmer on the inside. I said that exactly opposite. So uh, UHF signals and VHF signals will get trapped up in there, and it will function just like a um, – um, a fiber optic cable, you know, that light will get in there in a fiber optic cable and it will go for a long distance. Same thing with uh, tropospheric ducting, a, a radio signal will get into the tropospheric, get in there and it will basically bounce back and forth for long distances. Um, and the example I can give of that is, uh, the Hearst club has the 147.1 repeater here in Hearst in North Texas, about 600 miles away in, uh, I believe it's Brownsville. I can't remember exactly where it is. Uh, maybe it's Corpus Christi. They are that one of their repeaters is on exactly the same frequency. And it, whenever, uh, whenever the atmosphere is just right, the temperatures are just right. We will hear that repeater down in uh, Corpus or Brownsville or wherever it is, six, five, 600 miles away. We will hear that, um, as if it is, if we're sitting right here or sitting right next to that repeater. So it's a really interesting thing. It's, you, you really can't predict it. Um, but when it happens, I mean, you, you get amazing, uh, distant, uh, distant, uh, contacts, um, on VHF and UHF. So it's really kind of a, a neat thing that, that you experience. Hey, Chris. Yes, sir. That repeater is in gold weight, Texas. And it's next to brown wood. That's what you're thinking. Oh, of. brown wood. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, <laughs> but uh, it's. I yeah. mean, it's still. That's it's, a long way away. It is. It's yeah, really, it's really... it's like a three and a half hour drive, and we go down to Brownwood for a family reunion every year, and uh, and yeah, I've heard. I'm driving around Dallas Fort Worth. I've heard that repeater on our frequency before. It's really wild. So sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. But yeah, Goldway, Texas. <laughs> no, is where you're at that's there, perfectly dude. fine. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Something else that uh, some will attempt is uh, meteor scour. So meteor scatter, excuse me. So um, there is a date in August. It's actually my wife's birthday where uh, every year there is a meteor shower um, that comes through and you can bounce signals off of a uh, the, the, that, that greenish trail that comes uh, off of a meteor as it's entering the atmosphere. Uh, you kind of get a little bit of a, um, a warbly sound, pretty interesting. Um, but it's basically you're you are literally you're bouncing signals off of a meteor, and they are reflecting back. Uh, six meters is very effective for this for meteor scour uh, scatter. Excuse me. Uh, let's see here. Space and satellites. So some satellites have a circular orbit where they maintain a relatively constant distance from the Earth. Um, we talked about the other day, we talked a little bit about uh, satellites. Satellite sends telemetry reports on the condition of its systems, like batteries and transmitters and, and all the information it needs. Um, and then the ground controllers, whoever's, whoever's controlling it, sends telecommands to modify that, that, uh, that oper whatever the satellite's operations. Uh, the International Space Station is considered a low Earth, low Earth orbit amateur radio um, satellite station you can contact them uh, and then sometimes they do uh, they do have events where if they get that rare downtime they can get on the radio and you can make a contact with them and oftentimes if you make a contact with them they will send you a QSL card confirming your your contact so it's really neat it's a really fast thing you have to you have to be on your game and you have to be ready for it but once you once you lock into the frequencies and you're able to track it, it's a, it's a really neat thing. We have some some guys in the club that uh, uh, satellites is, is something that they enjoy doing. So communications with satellites use line of sight propagation. It is line of sight up to space. Amateur satellites they're basically repeaters. Um, you can talk around the world. There's either a, uh, there's two kind of repeaters up there. They're either 
immediate you know, retransmit just like a standard repeater or a store and forward. So you send a message to it, and then when it gets to wherever it is you wanted it to go, it will then transmit uh, the message down. So any amateur with a technician license or higher is allowed to transmit on the uplink frequency. The uplink frequency is the frequency where you're sending to the repeater. So any any amateur amateur radio operator holding a technician class license or higher can uh, talk to a satellite and then listen on its downlink frequency. Uh, downlink is typically on the two meter band, uh, 146 megahertz somewhere in that area. Uh, it's well documented out there. Um, so if that's something that you want to do, you just have to get those those frequencies, um, and then you can you can track those satellites so you'll see uh on the satellite information a u stro- uh, u stroke v as its sub band um and that'll let you know that it's it's got an uplink on uhf and a downlink on vhf and they do that for its technical reasons why they have to do that but uh that's that's set aside for satellites um in a specific sub band of each of those bands So the the satellite as it passes by, it there's a chance it may not be nice and you know a nice smooth pass. It may be tumbling, it may be spinning, it it could be doing any number of things. But rotation of the satellite and its antennas will cause cause what's called spin fading, where the sound where the uh, the the signal will quickly fade in and out, and you can hear it but it'll fade in and out as, as it is spinning around. One of the things that you have to, uh, you have to account for uh, if you're going to try and operate uh, satellites is you have, you do have to take in account Doppler effect. Uh, just as a motorcycle or a train passes you and the sound goes from a high, higher pitch down to a lower pitch, uh, you do have to take in account your, your frequency is going to be a little higher, and as it passes over, you're going to have to adjust your, your VFO down a little bit as it passes by. It's not a, not a lot, but uh, you do have to, in order to stay in contact with, you do have to make that, that, uh, that adjustment as it's flying over you. So at an altitude of 50 miles or greater, the FCC considers that station to be a space station. So anything, it could be a satellite or the uh, uh, the ISS or some other uh, space station, as long as it's 50 miles or higher, it's considered a space station. So, and as I said, the uh, the Doppler effect, it's going to increase it, as it's as it's coming to you. It's going to increase as it flies over you. It's going to begin to decrease. So you just have to kind of track that on your your VFO knob. The way you track satellites is uh, by using a, a computer program. You can use a web page. You can use a, a program to determine when an amateur station will f- or amateur satellite will fly over you. Um, these are called Keplerian elements, or KEPs, uh, as it's it's listed here. Basically, that it, what it does is it it just tracks the movement of satellites. Every satellite it'll it'll track. It'll say uh, you can put in your your grid square. And it will tell you exactly when it's going to be, um, when it's going to be at, you know, in your area, what angle, azimuth, uh, line of sight azimuth. It'll give you all that information in order for you to uh, to do the calculation and figure out what uh, angles and everything you need to keep your antenna so you can make that contact. So some questions: What mode is responsible for allowing over the horizon? VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis. Answer is tropospheric scatter. It's uh, it makes it sounds like it's just all the time. It it can be a rare thing. It's not uh, it's not something that you can plan for. It will come and go, just depending on the weather. Which part of the atmosphere enables the propagation of radio signals? around the world. Uh, 
that's going to be the ionosphere. Uh, most of uh, the, the first two kind of deal more with uh, weather-related things. The ionosphere uh, is going to be like that mirror in the sky, essentially. What can be used to determine the time period during which an amateur satellite or space station can be accessed? It's going to be in a satellite tracking program. We also call that Keplerian elements. Why are direct, not via repeater, UHF signals rarely heard from stations outside your local coverage area? I don't know if we covered this, but... Uh, good information UHF signals are are not reflected by the ionosphere they uh, they're e easily um, absorbed by buildings and things but they also go right through uh, the ionosphere what do the initials LEO tell you about an amateur an amateur satellite answer is going to be that it is a low earth orbit so it's a lot closer than uh, the geostationaries which are quite a few thousand miles away these are generally under a thousand miles what causes spin fading when referring to satellite signals it's going to be the rotation of the satellite and its antennas and they don't they generally do not have just one antenna they will have Antennas on the top and bottom, they'll have uh, um, kind of 45 degree angles off the, uh, that way there's complete coverage regardless of where it is and it will spin and you, you'll hear that, that, in it, that fading in and out while you're making that contact. Which of the following are inputs to a satellite tracking program? This is going to be B, the Kep Keplerian elements. This is a uh, uh, list of – it's constantly updating as the, uh, the orbits of the uh, satellites move. These are the, the information that that, that uh, um, program is able to use to, to be able to track that satellite. Why do VHF and UHF radio signals usually travel somewhat further than the visual line of sight distance between two stations? The Earth seems just a little less curved to a radio wave than it does to light. When using a directional antenna, how might your station be able to access a distant repeater if buildings or obstructions are blocking the direct line of sight? Answer is going to be to try and find a path that reflects the signals to the repeater. Um, that is literally if you have to bounce a signal off of a building, that is something that you can do. Uh, a is not correct, even though it didn't fade out. Um, the long path, that's not going to be very uh, effective on VHF and UHF because that's the long way around the world. Rather than going from A to B, you're going all the way around the world. That's an HF thing. That's not so much a VHF thing. Uh, questions that might have come up. Looking at the uh, chat real quick before we jump in to the next section. Okay. All right, we're going to go into digital. There is uh, there's a lot of information here. It's a lot, this is a really fun thing to do and. Uh, um, right now the, with the HF bands kind of having a, a difficult time due to low sunspots, um, sometimes digital is your only, your only, uh, your only choice. So, um, digital radio communications, is basically a way of taking information and coding it into, um, uh, some sort of a digital signal turning a radio carrier on and off in a predetermined pattern. Uh, that sounds an awful lot like Morse code on off on off. That's what digital is. So you can kind of say that uh, Morse code was the original digital um, shifting the frequency or phase of a radio carrier back and forth in a predetermined pattern is another 
another um, way you can create a digital signal. So radio signals, radio digital communications, they come in several types or modes, such as packet, which is sort of uh, like a, a, um, a, a, a LAN network at your house, um, wireless network at your house. Then you got MFSK, which is multi multi frequency shift key. I think it is. I may be may be wrong there. And then PSK thirty one. That's uh, to name a few. That is literally just a few of the the many different kinds that are out there. So CW, the original digital um, CW is shorthand for continuous wave. You you communicate using CW by switching a continuous carrier wave off and on and long and short pulses. Um, Combination of these pulses called codes represent letters, numbers, and punctuation. It's been around for uh, 100, 100, 125 years, maybe a little longer. Uh, The code used for ham radio communications is the International Morse Code. Just uh, uh, We don't have a special Morse Code. We just use the International Morse Code that's, that's been around. So you can send CW using a few different ways. You can use your keyboard. There are programs out there that will allow you to send your keyboard, and it's, uh, it's, it, it is becoming more and more popular. Uh, you can use an electronic keyer, which lets you go very fast, and then there is the uh, traditional straight key. Those are three different methods that you can use uh, in order to send and, and receive Morse code. So some of the digital communication types um, we're going to list here, basically using a computer uh, and a radio transceiver, and you're ready to go. Uh, CW, PSK31, Packet, uh, MFSK, WSJT Suite, that includes uh, JT65 and um, Whisper, I believe it is, uh, Slow Scan TV, FT8, uh, IEEE 802.11 Wireless, And uh, there are still even more digital modes. What we're going to do, we're not going to go over every single one of them, but uh, your computer is going to be part of your station uh, if you want to do digital. What you see here, this is, uh, I believe, I can't see it. I believe this is uh, PSK31 um, in that example on the the screen itself. Uh, It's going to generate and decode digital signals um, it will send and receive Morse code, uh, log contacts and contact information. Some uh, some programs have all this built into it. Um, sometimes you can control, using certain software, you can control the radio f- transceiver from your computer. You just click and it will change the information on the radio. Most of the time you can use the computer sound card or uh, some sort of software that can support numerous digital communications. Uh, there are quite a few of them out there. Um, basically, the uh, whatever the computer says is sent to the uh, to the sound card, and then an input on the radio itself, and then the radio to transmit. Um, you can use it to convert audio from radio from the radio to digital form. So, um, using a computer and amateur radio is is um, uh, makes you a very powerful station. Uh, there's some really neat things going on in ham radio Wi-Fi. Uh, there is some technology out there called broadband ham net or high-speed multimedia. Um, the most common one is called uh, Arden, Arden, A A R D E N, and it's basically a high-speed amateur radio-based data network using commercial Wi-Fi gear with modified firmware. Um, some guy here here in the uh, the mid cities, as well as uh, going up north, and then uh, uh, quite a bit down south, there is a big um, ham radio Wi-Fi art network, and that connects uh, North Texas up in the, the Denton area, which is about twenty five thirty miles. I mean, straight north, um, maybe a little further, and it's just using uh, direction based Wi-Fi uh, information. And it links up cities, and then once you have that that internet link, you can set up, uh, say, a background. I mean, excuse me, a um, a backup phone system or 
Wi-Fi. If for some reason the Wi-Fi in, a, in the say in the whole Metroplex goes down, uh, you can use whatever link is available in the uh, in the the Wi-Fi network. So it's really neat. It's a fun thing to do. We have uh, the Hearst Club has. Uh, a repeater, a DMR repeater, that all of its Wi-Fi or excuse me, all of its network connections are are going through um, an Arden network. So it's uh, some of our guys have a network, have the uh, the equipment at their house up on a tower, on the water tower. There's a uh, a node, and they just point it together, and there's about a probably a five or six mile link there using Wi-Fi and it's just something that we can do because it happens to use our frequencies. So it's really neat. I encourage you to look into that. Um, I'm glad that this is something that they're putting into uh, more current versions of the, of the question pool because it is taking off and there, there are many implementations out there that, uh, that are really neat and, and very powerful. I mean, it's, it's really neat. Uh, PSK 31 is, uh, it's, it's extremely simple to set up and use PSK means phase shift keying, and it's a, a low rate data transmission mode works well in noisy conditions. And basically what it is, is you will enter in a letter. The software will send that, that letter over the radio. So you can, you could watch people as they're typing on the radio, wherever they are, you can watch them typing. If they make a mistake, you can see them backspace. Um, it's very powerful. It can, it can get through on a, uh, a very noisy signal. Um, or, and you can just use your sound card and some free software. FL Digi is one, uh, is what it's called. You can get that from SourceForge. It's, it's a very powerful software, free and open source. Um, you can use it with your sound card, or if, if you need something a little more powerful, you can get a sound, some sort of a sound card interface to interface with your, your transceiver. So uh, I hope that you will give that a try because once you make a contact, it's, it's uh, quite an accomplishment. It's really, really neat to do. Oh, let me go back. Also, PSK31, uh, if you use an Android phone, there is, a, uh, there is an app on there called... Uh, I believe it's called PSK Droid, and you can take your phone and set it on a radio that's receiving PSK, and you can you can see it print out on your phone. It's really neat. It is a cost. I don't I don't uh, know how much it costs, but that isn't something as simple as just get taking your phone, setting it up there, and then you can watch the uh, watch the data come in from wherever. FT8 is a uh, rather new ish. Uh, hadn't been around very long. It's a digital communication mode, ideal for making contact under weak signal conditions. Um, it consists of data blocks that are sent and received in synchronized 15-second intervals. Your computer transmits, their computer transmits, yours, theirs, in 15-second intervals. Uh, you also use a sound card with this and some software. That's uh, also, I believe, it's open source and on the internet that you can get using a simple uh, sound card or some sort of interface connected to your radio. Um, FT8 is kind of the, uh, the new and going thing. I believe there's one that's going to be replacing it soon called FT4. Um, but if all, if you can't get out um, under anything, cause the, the bands are just in and uh, they're just too noisy, you can try FT8 and uh, very low power and you can make, very distant contacts. I mean, I've, I have been told I've never tried it, but I've heard uh, um, one watt FT8 signal from Dallas, from from the DFW airport to Japan. One watt is not uncommon, so um, it is a it's a really neat weak signal uh, mode. Packet radio is uh, just like uh, the easiest way to think about this is. Uh, an old phone modem where you, uh, you know, you dialed up AOL, you hear your modem, pick up the phone, dial its number, and then do all the, the, the beeps and everything that would go into it. That is a form of packet radio. Uh, we also do that in ham radio. Um, it's a form of digital communications where the computer basically breaks up the message into chunks 
hunks or packets of information. Um, it has built in error detection. So if, uh, if something is lost, the, uh, the TNC or the modem basically can request that information again. It works just like a, um, uh, not only like a phone modem, but, uh, uh, sort of like a router. Um, you can think of that. It, each packet has a checksum for error detection, a header with where the information is going. Um, it has the ability to repeat, to send a repeat request if it missed something. Um, so all of that is is connected together, but your computer is connected to your radio using the TNC. Um, usually you have to have a TNC if you want to do packet. You don't use your sound card. So uh, a TNC is a terminal node controller, and that is going to be your inf- interface between the computer and the transceiver. And like I said, it acts as if it was one of those old dial-up modems. It it keys up the transmitter, and it sends that data, and it, it waits to listen. And and so that's kind of uh, uh, the way that works. Uh, you've heard me mention APRS, uh, which is position reporting. Uh, APRS, autom- let's see, automatic position packet. It used to be position, now it's packet reporting system because they've kind of expanded out the uh, the ability uh, of, or its capability of what it can do. It takes global positioning system, uh, GPS information, translates it into an, an automatic packet of uh, a digital information and then transmits that. And if you look on this map... So right here is Hearst. This is kind of where I'm at. I believe there is a digipeter. I don't know where it is anymore. There are there's digit digipeters scattered around, um, scattered around, and they're connected to the internet uh, and connected to a radio. And so the radio will hear it, and then the software will relay that to the APRS network, and then it will dot. It will put a little red dot there, and you can actually track where uh, uh where people are going and this is all public so um if you are paranoid about google tracking you this is this is an extreme form of that it's uh anybody can look this up and see exactly where you go you can see some people following the following the interstates and uh and, and where they're going so this is really neat i've done this before you can also send text messages uh from one radio to the next so that's something uh that's something you should try. Um, the equipment cost is coming down uh, pretty rapidly, and so you ought to give it a try. It's it's really neat. So digital audio is uh, it's an analog audio waveform. It's sliced up into segments and assigned a digital value. So if you look at the uh, down here on the bottom, the audio analog to digital conver- conversion. Uh, software to the radio and then once the radio that receives it goes right back down to to break that down radio to software digital to analog conversion and then back to audio that's basically what digital is it's just uh broken up into chunks assigned a value transmitted and then and then on the other end it's decoded uh, we also have the uh, the ability to uh, utilize the internet vo- uh, uh, voice VoIP uh, technologies to connect multiple repeaters. So um, there's some software out there called IRLP. Uh, let's see. There's also Echolink, and then the new newcomer on the street that's very powerful is oh goodness, Jason. Do you remember what it's called? You know what it's called. Um, it's out of come to me, but it's a, it's I a was, very powerful system that, that connects your computer to the internet. I was, uh, I was answering a question. I didn't, or in the chat, I didn't hear what you asked. You, okay. We have Echolink. We also have all-star IRLP all-star. All-star. <laughs> I was going arts art. What is it? All-star. That's all-star. Uh, that's kind of the newer, the a new newcomer on the street, but it's right. very powerful. The audio is very good. And so you basically, you would talk into the repeater. The repeater would translate that into uh, internet an, an internet link, and then at the other end, you would tell that that repeater who you wanted to connect to. You have a node number, so you would say, "I want to connect to one, two, three, four. It goes out the internet. It connects to there, and now 
uh, cowboy can talk to, uh, looks like UPS man over here, over the repeaters connected over the internet. Um, and that is using VOIP voice over internet, just like your, uh, uh, your ho- your phone would. IRP, Echolink, those are the, the two. They've been around for a long time, Internet Radio Linking Project. And then Echolink is software that you can install on your radio. You can install it on there, and then you can connect to uh, repeaters. And so you can use your computers to talk to over the internet to another repeater. You don't even have to have a radio. So it's, it's really neat. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of fun. I've used it before. There's some, uh, some good people from all over the world on those. Uh, a gateway is going to be the connection between the internet and the radio. Usually it's some sort of say like a, a laptop or a computer or something like that, that has software on it that basically uh, it does the connection. It tells the links what to do. Each gateway has a node number, and it's always some sort of number. It's usually like a, a four to six digit number. That uh, that way you can you can transmit on your radio. You can punch in one two three four, and the software will link you to node one two three four. Connect, make that 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 link established, and then you can you can talk over the internet. This is a uh, this is a screenshot of uh, some of the active nodes. This is uh, uh, you can see the node number here on the left, uh, the call sign, where it is, province, uh, country, frequency. Um, this just gives you the information of of how to make that connection. It's usually just I want to connect to the first one. I key up my transmitter, node one thousand. My uh, my node will connect to. V7 RHS right there in Vancouver and make that link and I can now talk to somebody uh, over the internet and then through their repeater as uh, as we go back we have a QSO back and forth pretty neat um, one of the things that's out um, the book here is called the repeater directory that's something that the uh, the ARRL puts out every year uh, I believe they still put it out um, they're they they spend a lot of time basically updating all of the repeaters across the country uh, for all different kinds of modes uh, that you want to operate. They will they'll put all that in the book. It's, they'll publish it and then they'll start again. They will update everything and then once they get that done, they'll put out the 2009, 2010, so for, you know so on and so on. Um, there are many options out there now, like, uh, there's a website called repeater book. They have, uh, an app for iOS and Android that, uh, you get the same information. Usually it's, uh, it's updated, uh, more frequently because it's actually user updated. Um, so as something changes, I can log on to repeater book and I can update that information. And now that's updated for, all information. So it's called repeater book. It's a free app. Um, I would get that. Um, if you're interested in just seeing what's around you, cause it is, it does use GPS to, to pinpoint where you are. And then it shows you what's around within a specific area. A, uh, kind of a newer newcomer on the block. Uh, it's less than 10 years old. Uh, DMR. It's one of my favorite, one of my favorite, uh, digital modes. Um, Basically, it was developed, it was a standard, it is a standard developed by the European Telecommunication Standards Institute for commercial communications. Now, just like all other radio technologies, we can't leave it to be commercial only. We want it for ourselves too. So amateur radio operators have adopted this technology also. Um, It uses what's called time multiplexing technique. Uh, TDMA is what it is 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 what the uh, the actual um, acronym time division multiple access. What this means is uh, traditionally, if you use an FM repeater, if you use an FM repeater and you you key up the mic, your radio is constantly transmitting, constantly transmitting, never stops until you actually let off of the repeater off of the uh, the push to talk. DMR, what it does is it breaks your voice into a digital, uh, a digital packet 
and then transmits um, for a certain amount of time. It's very fast. It transmits, it stops. It transmits, it stops. It transmits, it stops. And it uh, it allows you to have more capacity uh, on a repeater than um, just the traditional where if, if you have two sets of people, one is talking, the other has to wait. Well, a DMR, you can have, because it's a, a pulse, you have a pulse, another radio will transmit, then that won't stop it. And so it's a constant, it's, it's a constant pulse of, of, you know, starting and stopping. Multiple people um, can talk at exactly the same time and never hear each other. Uh, this is something that uh, you, you might hear about on, on uh, Jason's channel a lot. It's uh, it's like I said, it's, it's fairly new. There are other standards out there. Um, I don't believe that they're growing as fast as DMR, but uh, digital voice is really neat. Uh, you can do very, uh, a lot of different things with it. So it, it basically allows two digital signals to exist on a single channel without interference. One is transmitting on on this at this time. The other is transmitting here. While this one is transmitting, this one is off, and so it's kind of like a step, a step, and so they will never hear each other, even though you're talking at exactly the same time. It's a very, very efficient way to uh, to use radio. You can it's just more capacity at at any given time. Um, this is showing what I mean by uh, the different um, the time pulses. We call them time slot one, time slot two. And you can see how they alternate back and forth, back and forth. So while time slot one is transmitting, time slot two is sitting patiently, and then they'll swap, and then they'll swap back and forth until uh, eventually um, until eventually the, uh, the, the transmission stops. Um, so that, that just allows more communications in a given, uh, a given channel at a, at a given time. It, it allows more capacity. Each time slot carries a different conversation. Um, if you're happy or not happy, if you're interested in learning more, I'll, uh, I'll give you a website that, uh, Jason and I both actually maintain regarding DMR, uh, but we'll do that later on, and you can check it out if you're interested in learning that. Uh, this is the exact radio that I have right here. Um, the way that digital communications work, they don't work like traditional FM. Digital will use a, um, a digital code. Uh, we'll call that a talk group um, to basically connect users across repeaters. So here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, we have different talkers. We have um, um, North Texas uh, wide. We have Texas statewide. Those are what we call talk groups. You can think of a talk group kind of like a traditional repeater. You get on there and you talk to whoever. Um that's that is one way to think about a talk group. So you're you're it's just it's like a kind of it's just a, a, a connection of, of it's like a chat room. There we go. It's like a chat room. Um there are multiple, there are hundreds of different channels depending on what your interests are. Uh if you want to talk statewide, every state has their own state uh ID talk group. Uh and then there's there's multiple uh, different kind of talk groups, you know, for local or worldwide or North America or U.S. or so there's there's any number. And this is something that digital kind of opens up. It, it allows you to uh, to be able to uh, kind of make the world a smaller place, essentially, with uh, uh, using using radio. It um, it connects more people together. So you program the desired talk group ID numbers into your radio. And I'm going to see if I can – you may not be able to see this. Let's see here. Probably – no, you're not able to see it. gets washed out. Well, I have like uh, different talk groups, North Texas wide, Texas, uh, Texas statewide, and things like that. And you can, you can put those in there 
uh, whatever you want and, and then connect with people on those top groups. Or the, in the, it's kind of like a chat room. Okay. So what does the abbreviation PSK mean? We went over that just a minute ago. Uh, it is one of the uh, more common modes of, of digital communications, and it basically means phase shift keying. It's just a digital uh, a method of making a digital signal. Which of the following is a digital communications mode? So we covered all three of those, packet radio, IEEE 802.11, and then JT65. Those are all three. Uh, they're, they're very common uh, modes. So which of the following would be connected between a transceiver and a computer and a packet radio station? This is a computer and a packet radio station. This is going to be a terminal, no control, a TNC. That's that's your digital modem connecting your your computer to your transceiver. How is access to an IRLP node accomplished? This is going to be by using DTMF signals. This is going to be by using the number pad on your radio, on your HT or your your handheld, your handy talkie. We call them HTs. Uh, or on your mobile radio, you can use the, the, the number keys there, DTMF signals. Uh, how would you select a specific IRLP node when using a portable transceiver? I may have just given that to you, and the answer is D. You're going to use the keypad to transmit. So you're actually going to transmit, hold down the transmitter, and you're going to punch in the numbers and the controller will connect you out. What does the term APRS mean? The answer is A, automatic packet reporting system. You may also see it as automatic positioning report, automatic position reporting system because it used to be a position only system. Now it actually does packet. You can send a text message to somebody and it'll pop up on the radio. So now it is called automatic packet reporting system, but you may see it the other way sometimes. What is a talk group on a DMR digital repeater? It's going to be a way for groups of users to share a channel at different times without being heard by others on the channel. And people can be scattered all over the all over the place. Uh, if it's a say Texas statewide, it will be people from all over the state of Texas, and some some that are out that have you know some sort of uh, connection with Texas. So it's it is it's just it can be any basically any any repeater, but they when you're on a certain talk group, they all connect on you know as a as one big repeater. Which of the following best describes broadband hamnet, um, or Arden is another name, also referred to as high-speed multimedia network? It's going to be an amateur radio-based data network using commercial Wi-Fi gear with modified uh, firmware. Works very well, and it's uh, widely deployed all across the Metroplex here. Uh, questions for the chat. 